Hello, welcome to Apes Chapter 20 Lecture Part 1. This chapter is titled Conventional Energy Alternatives, and these are alternatives to fossil fuels. All right, let's begin. All right, so let's begin by talking about that. More than 80% of our energy comes from these fossil fuels, and two-thirds of our, our electricity production. So when we talk about energy needs, we're talking about heating and cooking. It's not necessarily only electricity production, but quite a bit of our energy needs are, are reliant on fossil fuels. We have some conventional alternatives. They are nuclear power, which is being used. You can see over here, nuclear power falls in this category, about world energy consumption, about 4.8%, and electricity production, about 10%. Hydropower is in this mix. Hydropower for electricity is about 16.3%. Um, biomass energy, we'll talk about that in a great deal. Biomass energy is in a smaller amount. We're talking about in this area right here, 5.7% for electricity production. But a lot of biomass is used for heating and cooking. So you'll notice the numbers are a little higher for, for actual just world energy consumption of bioenergy. Here in the US, we're not burning wood necessarily to heat our homes. So uh, places that are developed, you're going to use a lot less bioenergy. Uh, are these better than fossil fuels? Well, they have less impact than fossil fuels. Even uh, nuclear power, believe it or not, has much less impact than fossil fuels. So these are what we would call conventional alternatives. Our next chapter will focus on what are called the new renewables, not this chapter, which we'll get into solar, wind, and geothermal and ocean power. That is chapter 21. Let's begin with talking about nuclear power. If you notice, the U.S. produces the most nuclear power, but we are not necessarily the most reliant on it. About 19.5% of our electricity production comes from it, but we do produce the most. France, much smaller nation, they are more reliant on nuclear power, if you look at it here. Um, who else is on that list? Ukraine is on that list pretty high. Sweden's pretty high. Sweden is in the central case in your chapter. South Korea is pretty high. Showing their, their percentages. These are places that are more reliant on nuclear power. So what is nuclear energy? Well, if you look at this uranium atom, there's protons and neutrons in this mix. This, is, this would be the nucleus of a uranium atom. And this is a bunch of protons and neutrons. These orange things, protons, these brownish purple things, whatever color that may look like, these are your neutrons. This is an atom. This is the central part or the nuclear part of the atom, the nucleus. These are held together really tight, and when you can get these things to break apart from each other, there's a lot of energy that is released in this process. So nuclear energy, it's the energy that holds together the protons and neutrons in the nucleus of an atom. That's where it comes from. A reactor, this is the facility that you're going to be producing electricity in. So you're going to be using nuclear power to produce electricity in the facility. We'll talk about that in a second. This is a fission reaction, which is, means a splitting apart reaction. How does it work? Well, a neutron from another element like californium, which happens to be radioactive, can release neutrons. That neutron can smash into the uranium atom. And if you can slow down the neutron, to, and you need to slow it down to get it to do it, if you slow down neutrons, they can smash into the nucleus of a uranium atom and they can split it apart. When that happens, energy is released. Smaller atoms are created as a result of it, and you have some neutrons that are also released too. So this process produces a great deal of energy, and this is what we use in atomic bombs. So how does it work? Well, this is a reaction, a reactor. All right, so let's look what we got. We got these things. These big things here are called control rods. All right, down here we have our fuel rods. This is our fuel right here, nuclear fuel. You have a bunch of water floating around in here, and that's your, and that water, and 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 sometimes it could be a graphite, for example. That is your moderator slows down things in there. Okay, that's in their vessel. You have a, a circulation of water. Okay, this water eventually can become steam. Look, the steam moves through and eventually spins a turbine. So let's go through this whole process. Um, what do you have? Well, you have fuel rods, and these fuel rods contain uranium-235. And that uranium-235, you need to start a reaction. So a reaction gets started. You bombard it with a neutron. The goal is to bombard it with one 
a neutron. What do they use to bombard it with a neutron? They generally use something else, another atom that is radioactive that they have more control of, something they know uh, the rate at which it releases neutrons. Uh, like californium, for example, which is the element that I do believe they use. Um, I believe californium was uh, discovered at Cal Berkeley. Um, so they, they smash a neutron into these into the fuel that's inside of these nuclear and in, in these control rods. And that creates a reaction, a chain reaction starts taking place, right? So let's begin. Let's talk about all the major terms. The moderators, what do they do? Well, the moderator is that liquid inside of there, and it slows down the neutrons. Why do you need to slow down neutrons? Because if they're moving too fast, they will not impact or run into the uh, uranium. So if they're moving too fast, they will not create the fission reaction. So they need to slow down by moderators. So the moderator is in here. All right, so what does that do? That creates a reaction. Okay, that creates a reaction. And that reaction causes a release of neutrons, as you saw in the fission reaction. And those neutrons bang into more uranium-235, which bangs into more uranium-235, which bangs into more uranium-235. Okay, well, there's control rods. These control rods that are inside of here, what do they do? They absorb a lot of these excess neutrons that are happening. Otherwise, this reaction would go out of control with all these neutrons being released every time a fission reaction takes place. So every time a fission reaction takes place, those released neutrons can in turn create more fission reactions. So control rods slow that down. They absorb those neutrons and they slow down that reaction. What does this process do? It generates a great deal of heat. That heat boils water. That water turns into steam. That steam spins the turbine, and within the generator, you have magnets and copper wire. And as you spin magnets around copper wire, you can generate an electric current. The, the turbine, the generator, very similar to a coal fire plant or a natural gas plant. Okay, so this is basically how it works. There is usually a, a meter or so at least of concrete around this building to prevent any leakage or any issues. It's a very, the whole goal is to keep it contained. Very expensive to maintain these buildings, very expensive to, to make sure they, uh, to decommission them in case, in case you're not using them. So let's talk about the fuel for this process. The fuel for this process is usually uranium-235. Most uranium in nature is not uranium-235. Most of it is uranium-238 because this is from the periodic table. Uranium-238, this is an average atomic mass, so you expect to find uranium-238 most often in nature. In order to do fission and in order to do these types of reactions that we're talking about, we need uranium-235. Okay, so uranium-235, these elements that we're using and what they break down into, they have long half-lives. So you end up having wastes that sit around for a long time. Um, uranium-235, for example, um, has a half-life that is, I believe, uh, millions of years, basically. It takes a long, 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 long time for uranium-235 to break down. So even their products take thousands or up to thousands of years to break down, and that's an issue, all right? So the amount of time it takes for something to break down is the half-life, all right? So what do they do to uranium? Well, when you find a bunch of uranium-238, they need to enrich it. They need to get it, um, they need to get that uranium uh, having a higher percentage of uranium-235, because about 99% of it is uranium-238. So they need to get it up to about 3% to what's termed enriching the uranium. So this is what you may hear about happening in certain countries that are trying to develop nuclear weapons, for example, they'll start enriching uranium. And then you're wondering, well, why are they enriching it? It's either gotta go into a, a weapon or it's gonna go into uh, the production of electricity. So in order to do that, they use what's called a centrifuge. It's an it's a interesting process, how they enrich it. They convert it into a gas, spin it, the heavier particles um, go to the edges, the lighter particles stay towards the center, and the lighter particles are uranium-235. The heavier particles are uranium-238, so they discard the uranium-238 and save the uranium-235. This happens in what's called a centrifuge. All right? So what do they do? Well, then they take those uranium-235 that's been enriched, and they, they convert it into an oxide, and they put it in the fuel rods and insert those in the reactor. Okay. 
Um, basically, the emissions from nuclear power are very, very low. There is not a lot of, of emissions. And emissions are gases that are released. There's not a lot of emissions. That's one of the, the benefits of nuclear power. You don't, you're not releasing sulfur oxides or nitrogen oxides or carbon dioxide. You're not releasing that. The big drawback of nuclear power and nuclear energy is disposing of all that radioactive waste. It has a long half-life, sits around for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, and you got to put it somewhere and hold on to it that whole time, basically. It creates a lot of havoc and a lot of problems. This is showing you comparing coal and nuclear power. So let's go through them. Land and ecosystem disturbances from mining. Remember mining. You got to mine for both of these because uh, uranium needs to be mined. You don't need as much uranium, so it is less extensive. You need a lot more coal, so it does more damage. Greenhouse gas emissions, none from operating the plants and nuclear. Okay, None. Hardly any greenhouse gas emissions. Considerable for coal. Um, the reason we're comparing the two is a lot of plants around the world use coal and nuclear power. A lot of people are scared of it because of the potential for accidents, but it is a conventional alternative to coal. It might even be a better alternative. Air pollutants, look at these sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, all due to coal. None of those from nuclear power. These are the big problem causers. Sulfur dioxide leads to sulfur and nitrogen oxide leads to acid rain, to smog, to lung damage, to different other volatile organic compounds. You're talking a lot of nasty stuff as a result of burning coal. Radioactive emissions, none from coal. And there isn't really any, any emissions from nuclear unless there's an accident. Occupational health, that means the people that have to work in these fields. People, coal miners, a lot of fatalities and problems. It's dangerous, um, much fewer in nuclear. Health impacts on residents. Well, when you're burning coal, we don't do it here where we live locally, but where it's happening, it creates a lot of, a lot of uh, nasty air, basically. Air pollution in those areas and downwind is awful. None of that with nuclear. Effects of accidents or sabotage. Well, you're not really worried about that with coal, coal fire plants. But with nuclear plants, um, terrorism, sabotage can be a big deal. Solid waste. A lot of solid waste is generated from coal. There is solid waste generated nuclear, but there's just much less of it. You're just talking a lot more mass is generated from coal. Radioactive waste, none from coal. That's a positive, and you do get radioactive waste from nuclear. Um, fuel supplies remaining, how much coal is remaining, it should last. This is speculation. Several hundred more years. Nuclear, we don't really know. You don't need a lot. Hopefully down the road, we can develop more better practices um, involving maybe fusion reactions. And we'll talk about that in a second. What is nuclear fusion? Well, fission was breaking apart. Fusion is connecting. So you take two different atoms and you connect them. And in that process, you have a release of energy and you have a new atom. This new atom is determined by how many protons you added together. So in this case, you have one hydrogen atom here. Okay, and there's a neutron, another hydrogen atom with two neutrons. You fuse them or stick them together. And now you have two protons. This is a helium atom. Okay, in this process, some neutrons are also released. This process, if we could figure out how to get this energy return on investment above one, could virtually supply the world with energy by using something as simple as a, we can supply quite a bit of energy just with a cup of water. That water has enough hydrogens in it where we can, can we can do fusion and we can basically basically create enough energy for a city using just a cup of water. It wouldn't be that difficult to do. The problem is, is it's so hot. It's so much more powerful. I don't know, about 100 times on average more powerful than an atomic bomb if we had a hydrogen bomb. Hydrogen bombs, have, I don't believe, have ever been used in war. Um, they've tested them before. They're about 100 times more powerful they would destroy places where an atomic bomb would take out a city, a hydrogen bomb would take out, you know, the entire, that entire country and, and then some rather than just the city. So fusion reactions, they get too hot. So the amount of input of energy makes the energy return on investment below one bad investment. So we don't use it. This is the sun. Our sun is a star and our sun, the energy from our sun comes from fusion reactions. Three Mile Island. 
Three Mile Island was a situation where human error and some mechanical failure uh, drained water from the reactor vessel. When this took place, this was what's called a near-miss disaster. It wasn't a disaster, but it could have been, and this freaked people out when this happened. Um, you need to be aware of what happened at Three Mile Island. What is a meltdown? Well, when it gets so hot that it melts the uranium pellets, it melts the metal that they're sitting in, that metal can then in turn melt the reactor and cause a meltdown where you can actually leak, uh, uh, you can leak waste, um, radioactive waste in the atmosphere. Chernobyl happened in Ukraine. This was back in 1986, an explosion. There's even a show on TV about this. Uh, if you watch the show, you'll notice quite a few people died as a result of trying to help uh, remediate it. So 31 people were killed directly by the accident. Um, they think of at least 30 more, 29 to 30 more firefighters who were on scene afterwards probably died, not to mention how many people nearby developed cancers and got sick as a result of it. In 2011, a uh, an earthquake off the coast of Japan created a tsunami, which took out the uh, the, the power to the to the cooling react to basically cool the reactor, and there was major issues. It's created uh, radioactivity was released. People gave up their lives to help put out you know help control this meltdown, control the situation. It was it was very sad, basically very very sad. The place to this day is still abandoned. Waste disposal of waste is very difficult. That's why the reason is because things have hundreds of millions of years of half lives. These half lives make it very difficult to make it very difficult to to dispose of the waste. So what is happening? Well, these this map here shows you where the places around the the country where they're basically storing these wastes, and they have to store them below ground in concrete casks. They tried to store it in Yucca Mountain in Nevada, but that did not happen. Um, people did not want all this nuclear waste being stored there. It was an ideal place to store it because it was away from people. It didn't have a lot of seismic activity. Um, there wasn't a lot of ground. There wasn't groundwater issues there, but people did not want it to take place. Nuclear power. Um, basically, it slowed down. The last few years, people are more fearful of it. That's one of the big problems. Problem is it's very expensive. So we're all talking about energy return on your investment. There's a financial investment that goes into it. They've decommissioned San Ofre here in, in you know in California, in Southern California. And um, it's very expensive. They're realizing how costly it is. They're even storing some of the spent nuclear wa uh, waste there currently until they can figure out a place to put it. We will stop there. <laughs>